the world was shutting down and uh, we were sent back home and like many economists, maybe many of you, uh, we felt a need to do something about it. <laughs> Uh, and what could we do? What could we do about it? Well, we had spent, and when I say we, it's a bunch of people, uh, um, Abhijit Banerjee, Aron Chandrasekhar, Emily Breza, Ben Olken, and others had spent uh, a fair amount of time uh, talking about, uh, thinking about how to encourage the take up of preventive behavior, in particular vaccination uh, in developing countries. And that had led us to think about the role of, of communication, and in particular, communication by trusted figures in uh, this, uh, uh, in doing so. So exactly two years ago, when we were sent home, we decided to try and, and, and kind of apply what we had known, what we had learned, and maybe try to learn a little bit along the way. And very naturally, we, we started with India, uh, which is where we had uh, connection. So uh, in India, uh, in late March and April of 2020, there was, like in the US, a very strict nationwide lockdown. Uh, in early May already, it, it started loosening. Our intervention takes place in this context where uh, it's post the lockdown, but interventions are already, um, uh, the restrictions are already loosening. So there is some possibilities of uh, choices. The population was bombarded with messages about COVID-19. Uh, we did a survey that I'm going to talk to you about in a minute and where we asked people over the phone, you know, whether they had heard about uh, social distancing or any other uh, COVID prevention. Remember, this is way pre-vaccines. And on average, they had received something like 20 messages on social distancing in the last two days, from jingles on the radio to text on their phones, etc. So in this context, it's possible that sending yet another message might have a very limited impact. Uh, people seem to know more or less what was recommended, but the compliance was far from universal. Only about two thirds pretended that they washed their hands with soap when coming home from a trip outside. It's probably an over report. 37 had traveled outside the village in the last two days. Uh, and uh, um, they had, you know, at least 11 interactions with people outside their home in the past two days. So our experiment was, uh, our question was whether an extra unexpected nudge from a reliable source improved compliance. And our first effort was to find out who was the, going to be our reliable source. And we investigated working with some film stars. And then finally, one of our collaborators, uh, a, a, doc, a Bengali doctor called Abhijit Chaudhuri, said, well, but you do have your stars. That's uh, Abhijit Banerjee. He um, you know, had recently won the Nobel Prize at the time, just a few months prior. He was also the chair of the West Bengal uh, COVID response team. Uh, which had just been created to so think of it as the Dr. Fauci of West Bengal, although uh, without the medical expertise. Uh, and he's very well known in West Bengal. It's kind of, uh, you know, he's on billboards and magazines and stuff. So, uh, so the idea is that, you know, something said by him might make a difference. So at the time, we were primarily interested in uh, uh, being effective <laughs> more than in testing whether it matters to have, you know, Abhijit Banerjee as opposed to someone else speaking. So we decided to put our best foot forward. And, uh, and although we experimented, because that's what we do, we wanted to know whether it was going to work in this context. We didn't try to randomize Abhijit Banerjee versus someone else. In retrospect, maybe we should have done that. Instead, but we kind of were, you know, we didn't have equipoise. We thought he would be more helpful than something else, or someone else. So instead of randomizing the messengers, we randomized the message. Uh, and we tried, uh, we tried different form of the videos. So in total, we had uh, eight um, uh, uh, groups, uh, two by two by two, plus uh, a control group. Uh, the, the things that could vary were whether we emphasized social distances versus hygiene, whether we motivated the need to act by externality, which is, you know, you have to protect your grandmother versus internality, which is, you know, this thing can be bad. And then uh, 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 we 
spoke about how to deal with people with COVID, like uh, in particular, do we have uh, messages against ostracism versus no mention? The experiment was randomized at the pin code level. Uh, uh, so that's kind of the equivalent of a postal code. Uh, we sent the, so the messages, uh, so there are 1,264 pin code in West Bengal. We, we left 500 as control, the other 1,200 was treatment. And the messages were sent to all of the subscribers of one particular network, uh, that's the geo network. So uh, the video were pushed to the subscriber of that network. Because of randomization, we can look at whether there is an effect of this intervention, uh, whether that makes a difference, uh, the message content makes a difference, and also because we only uh, con contacted the geo people and not the non-geo people, we can see whether it makes a difference to, uh, uh, to have a geo subscriber versus non-geo subscriber. Uh, for data, of course, at the time, there was no uh, measurement of COVID uh, available. Uh, so we could only measure behavior. Uh, we first did a phone survey uh, of former council number, which is a bigger database we could get our hands on uh, for self-reported uh, uh, things, plus self-reported uh, self uh, behavior, plus um, uh, uh, non-self-reported behavior, uh, so that is report behavior of the rest of the community. And uh, to have a harder measure of uh, action, we also asked, so all of the videos were encouraging people to report their uh, symptoms to the frontline health worker, the ashes. Um, so what we did is within five days of treatment, so before there could be any symptoms of the actual disease, we interviewed the uh, ashes to know whether anybody reports symptoms to them. So that's a much more, that's a much better outcome because it's not self-reported, it's according to the ASHA uh, who went and talked to them. And because the video encouraged them, uh, people to do just that, we should see more of that. So what do we find? Uh, so we find that the, the, the treatment had a very large impact on reporting of the symptoms to the, to the ASHA. And remember, it can't be because it made people sick because that's before. Uh, and it also had, because of the scale, it's harder to see, but it also had impacts on the other behavior, uh, like uh, um, washing your hand, uh, or going outside the village, or wearing a mask. The other thing that we found, and that's going to be a bit of a theme of this presentation, is that the specific content didn't seem to matter so much. Uh, if you look at the various, these are the various interventions, uh, so there are eight different groups, and if you compare them, uh, they really have no difference. They are all, you know, they have all negative effects on traveling outside the village and on uh, interactions and on using a mask, uh, 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 and uh, we see no difference across treatment. So the intervention led to substantial improvements in health preserving behavior. We also found that there were spillovers to behavior of the non-geo subscriber, to those who did not get the videos. So either because the people spoke to them or because, uh, uh, um, yes, likely because the people spoke to them or maybe forwarded the videos. Something which is interesting as well is we have just added another uh, me hard measure of outcomes, which is uh, the, the number of ping in the Facebook network, which you're going to see I'm going to use a lot to measure mobility. In India, you can't really, it's not a clean measure of mobility because uh, uh, it's only on if people keep their phone on. But uh, in general, when they don't use the phone, it's off. But what we do find is that in treatment places, uh, they, uh, the phones are, uh, we, we, we notice more phones, we see more phones inside our treatment area than uh, um, compared to the control area. That could mean two things. One is that uh, people are more likely to be home. And the other is that they are more likely to keep the phone on, perhaps because they are not moving as much and they, they, they don't go out, so they move their activities online. So either, regardless of the exact intervention, this uh, additional outcome shows that there is something real in the impact of this intervention. What we do not know, of course, is the same messages would have worked if it was sent by a less credible source, because in this case, we didn't randomize that. 
at the same time, uh, where we uh, started working in, in West Bengal, we also, of course, were very taken by what was happening in the US, and in particular by the clear uh, um, impression from the very beginning of the pandemic that the pandemic was a twindemic, which is it was a comp it was both the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic plus uh, the systemic uh, racism uh, in health that we are interacting in producing outcomes that have been absolutely terrible uh, for black and uh, in particular African American and Latinos over the course of the pandemic. So this we didn't know yet in May, but it became clear later, the mortality of African American COVID-19 pandemic were four times larger. What we did know in, 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 in May, what was already discussed in May, is that uh, the, the messaging towards the black community was not very uh, necessarily very well thought out. In particular, a lot of the figures that you saw discussing uh, the, the pandemic were very white and uh, perhaps not the best messengers uh, to communicate to these communities. So in the same way that we were looking for trusted figures for to speak to people in rural West Bengal, we also thought about looking for trusted people to talk to uh, black uh, communities in the US. But of course, there the trusted figures had to be different. And what we decided to do is to partner with the uh, uh, um, diversity uh, and uh, inclusion center at the Massachusetts General Hospital and to work with a group with a diverse group of, of doctors uh, to to have doctors communicate di directly to people. So we started by doing two studies that were a little bit proof of concept uh, to see what matters in the type of messages uh, and messaging both messengers and messages uh, to, to whether it's, it, the messages need to be tailored to the Black and Latino community to be effective or not. Uh, the two studies are very similar in design, and I'll, I'll show you the, the results. So they were done, uh, uh, these two studies were done online. Uh, not through a, a massive uh, networks like Facebook or, or cell phone messaging, but through smaller platforms uh, uh, on Qualtrics, so using the, the Lucid, which is an online surveying platform. For Lucid, these are relatively large samples compared to what I already showed you in West Bengal or what I'll show you later in the US is relatively small. We had 11,000 uh, black and Latinos uh, in May, and then 20,000 black and white in September. In both cases, what we had is a diverse doctor from NGH and, uh, and the Lean Community Health Center, which is a, um, a, a small community health center outside of Boston, read three information statements about COVID-19 and preventive behavior. Uh, I won't show you one of the video because I haven't um, I haven't set up the shirt so that you see the you hear the, the sound. Um, we varied different aspects of the messengers and the messengers, and then we surveyed uh, people online to measure outcome. Uh, in the first study, we only surveyed immediately. In the second study, we actually looked for people later. Uh, we have a bunch of questions there. First is whether the video make any difference, whether it matters that the, the, the doctors who speaks as the same race as the respondent. Uh, uh, there was study by Marcela Alsen, one of our co-authors, showing that this, this had been important in the past. And then uh, some things about some variation in the content of the framing. Uh, one is whether the acknowledgement of prior injustice uh, uh, matters in particular. So this, this idea of like, uh, you cannot communicate to someone in particular about health without acknowledging that the health system is a little bit sticked against them. And then we had a social norm inter uh, intervention on, on mask wearing behavior that I'll show you in, a, in, a, in more detail in a minute. So in general, people were recruited, then they, uh, they, uh, they were randomized into uh, either a control group or a different treatment group. The randomization was done at the individual level. People either got uh, a concordant, racially concordant or discordant doctors, or they could also get uh, a, like a Trump administration person instead of a doctor. Uh, and then they had the social norm intervention or not. Uh, so that's 
you don't know, you need to see. That's an example of how the video uh, uh, looked like. These are uh, different doctors. In this case, they are all male, but uh, we also had female doctors, in fact, more female than male. Uh, so you could receive either a, a, a black doctor, a Latino doctor. In fact, the Latino doctor could also speak in Spanish and or a white doctor. And they speak white non-Latino doctor. And they, uh, they wear their uh, medical garb and they, uh, and, and they deliver uh, three small uh, videos about COVID and what to, pre what to do to prevent it. Let me say a bit more about the social norm intervention. Uh, so one thing that we uh, that a lot of people spoke about at the very beginning of the pandemic and certainly you heard that on the radio in the newspaper etc is that african americans were reluctant to wear masks because the perception in particular of a white male of a black male wearing a face covering is that they are trying to hide something so what we did before the experiment is that, uh, so the, the, the worry is that if, Af suppose this is true, then African-Americans might be uh, uh, particularly reluctant to wear a mask so that they are not, you know, um, accused of potential mal malfeasance. Or even if it's not true, but if it's believed to be true, they might still be reluctant. And there is a lot of work, for example, by uh, Leo Bernstein and others showing that, uh, people are often uh, mistaken about social norms and by correcting uh, the perception of the social norm, you can actually change behavior. So a few days before launching the main experiment, we carried out an online experiment where we uh, um, showed people this type of, the respondents this type of picture. So this is another set of people. And we ask them, you know, do you believe this person is sick? Do you believe they're up to no good? Do you believe they're protecting their communities? And people also saw the same thing for, uh, sometimes it was black people, sometimes white people, etc. And the bottom line is that eight out of 10 people uh, in the respondents across the US thought that the black person wearing a mask is protecting their communities. So this is the information we gave them during the intervention. The subject is first asked about the perception of others uh, when they see a photo like this. Uh, so not their own views, but what they are asked is, if, if, if I were to show someone a photo like this, what would they say that this person, you know, how many of them they had to move a slider to say, how many people would think this person is sick? How many people would think this person is protecting their community? How many person would think this person is up to no good? So we first ask them their opinion then they show a video uh, of the doctor speaking about masks. The first script just say, even if it sometimes puts you in an awkward position, please wear a mask. Remember, we are talking about uh, May, so it's very early. Uh, masks are not universal yet. And in the second uh, script, we said in an MIT survey, our eight out of 10 people answered that this person is protecting the communities. And then towards the end of the survey, at the very end, we ask them again, they're posterior now, like how many people do you think are affected by, by this? Uh, so now for results. So on average, this in May, this first intervention, this intervention affected knowledge. Uh, so in the few questions we asked, we asked uh, up to five questions. Uh, uh, 72% of the control got everything right, 80% of the treatment got everything right, and the, the, so people knew a little more. However, their first, in this first survey, we didn't have great measure of behavior, well, like, because we couldn't resurvey, it was uh, a bit of a crazy time. We, didn't even, we couldn't even do uh, incentivized things like asking people to buy masks or so on. So all we could do is to offer people a bunch of links that they could click for more information. And on average, we don't see a, a difference there. So people learn something, but we don't see something on, on action except in one group, which is the African-American, uh, when, uh, when the doctors is, is also African-American. Uh, so this is the, uh, the IAR here, which is basically the kind of the proportional increase in the number of linked asked. So we see an increase of about 9% in number of, of, of linked asked in uh, compared to 
no concordance when there is concordance. So when there is concordance, people, uh, the African Americans seem to be responding a little more, but it's really not that big. Uh, the other form of tailoring did not matter. In particular, uh, if we look at the social norm intervention, it did affect the view on social norms. So people uh, uh, underestimated the fraction of respondents who would say this is actually so, uh, someone who is protecting their community. So we tell them they get it. They, they move towards what we tell them. But when we uh, look at whether it affects uh, uh, other form of knowledge or whether it affects demand for more information about masks, uh, we don't see any impact, In part, even for people whose priors uh, uh, were initially very non-favorable and became more favorable. So none of the content, again, seem to matter. You notice this is something we already found uh, in the uh, in the Banerjee study, uh, that uh, people listen to what we have to say. Uh, they seem to retain the information, but the specific content doesn't matter. Uh, so the intention, the intention of this project had never been to stop at just one wave. Uh, we always wanted to have more than uh, we always wanted to have a scale up after the fact. Uh, we just wanted to make sure it works and that we we tailor the message in the right way, and then we wanted to um, do something that was on a much larger scale. But after this study, uh, we, we thought we did not know enough because we didn't have a good measure of behavior, uh, even self-reported behavior. We had no data on whites and we were concerned about, you know, very different effects for whites. And also, uh, at the end of the spring, the, the racial uh, justice protest started. Uh, then there was the election with more and more polarization. And we thought that maybe some of the things we didn't find, for example, the modest effect of, of concordance and the lack of effect of tailoring to specific community would actually change. So we thought before scaling up, we need to do a second study. And we did a second study of a very similar uh, uh, model, uh, but that happened uh, in the fall. Uh, we, uh, what does it, if you remember, we had in the in the first study an ag acknowledgement section where we were asking, we were acknowledging the uh, the fact that. Uh, uh, African American or Black people haven't been treated well by the health system systematically. It turns out this is this was just you know a very weak statement compared to the kind of statements that every single organization starting to put out after the killing of George Floyd and the racial justice protest. So we were interesting to so ours didn't work, but we were interesting to see whether some things more strongly worded would make a difference. And in particular, it sort of has a, a, a broader appeal because this is what everybody was doing at the time. So clearly they were expecting a, a, an effect of it. So what we did is that uh, before the doctors, uh, people saw uh, a statement. Uh, the American Medical Association from time to time issues consensus statement of what they are thinking about. And they had issued one in June, uh, which goes like that. The American Medical Association recognizes that racism in a systemic, structural, institutional, and interpersonal form is an urgent threat to public health, the advancement of health equity, and a barrier to excellence in the delivery of medical care. And it continues like that. So what we did is before the doctors talking about COVID, we had one actor, uh, uh, black or white, uh, read the statement or read a placebo statement, another one by the American Medical Association on drug pricing. And then people receive uh, otherwise the same, uh, um, uh, the same thing as before. This time I'm going to show you the, the, the randomization flow because it's more complicated. So we started with 20,000 people, uh, 10,000 white, 10,000 black, stratified by race. People were assigned to the uh, um, AMA uh, racism statement or to a placebo. We also varied the race of the actors reading the message. Then regardless, stratified by these groups, they were assigned to either a black or a white doctor. Uh, and then they either received COVID messages or a placebo. And within COVID, there was one more variation, which is 
In some cases, we insisted that the mortality was four times as large for blacks, and in, in half of the case, we, we did not. So there we were interested not only in whether for the black community we, we find a, an impact of the AMA statement, we find an impact of concordance, uh, and also for white people, whether we find uh, a potential backlash. For example, many of our black doctors were concerned that if we insist on the fact that the, the incident is much larger on the blacks, uh, the, the, the black doctor, would, the, the white patient would not be interested. The recruitment was very much the same. We recruited, we randomized, they got the delivery, we were an end line. Uh, we did a bit more in the end line. In particular, we collected data over donations. Uh, what do they prefer to donate to a COVID or a Alzheimer foundation? And then do they prefer to donate to a economic uh, support donation for anybody who needs it versus black uh, people, especially? And we now had masks to sell, so we could elicit the willingness to pay for, for masks. In addition, we were able to resurvey a few days later to ask about safety behavior. Some interesting background, uh, which is that blacks, you know, our, our um, kind of starting point was that maybe black one reason why black people have higher incidence is that they, they know less what to do to, to prevent themselves. But in fact, it's not, it, it is true, uh, but they are, uh, they have a higher knowledge gaps, so they know less than the whites, but they are much more careful. In terms of self-reported behavior, uh, almost 45% of blacks were always wearing a mask outside versus white, 20 for the whites. And that's just an example. All of the behavior uh, are, are much more careful in the black communities. See, con conversely, the, the, the Republicans have similar knowledge gaps to the Democrats, but they are much less careful. Before the intervention baseline, 30% of Democrats always wear a mask outside versus 15% of Republicans. Now, what was the in impact of the intervention? So first of all, we replicate our results from May, uh, in fact, even larger in a way, we find a pretty large impact of knowledge of the intervention, which so people once again listen to to what we had to tell them. Secondly, in this case, actually, we find impact on behavior. Uh, first, there was more information link were asked, the willingness to pay for masks increased, and uh, uh, to our great surprise, I must say, three days later, the adherence to safety behavior increased. So this is a safety gap score, so the higher the worse, and you can see that more people in the treatment group have no gap and fewer people have, have four gaps that is done to anything that we asked. Uh, people were also more likely to, to want to give to, in the treatment group, to want to give to a COVID charity as opposed to an Alzheimer charity. And people were also more likely to want to give to a black charity as opposed to a white charity. So that's the first. Uh, so in some sense, this intervention uh, was even more uh, um, impactful than the first one in that, or maybe we measured the outcomes better, uh, but certainly there was still some effectiveness there. The other thing we replicate is we find zero effect on behavior of any of our variation. The American Medical Association treatment did nothing. The, this time the concordance did nothing either. The black dot doc did nothing either for either blacks or white. And there was also no impact of the reminder of the disparate burden on knowledge or behavior, neither on the black nor on the white. So no kind of reinforcement effect for black, no backlash effect for whites. The only thing we found, uh, but I don't want to insist on it because it's not something we had pre-registered, is that uh, to have a black doctor increase the, or to, uh, or to, to emphasize the disparate uh, burden, increase the donation to black charity, both among black and white. So that creates a little bit of solidarity towards. So again, we replicate the same finding as we had for the third time now, which is the messages itself. Uh, the details of the messages doesn't usually matter. A result that was very surprising to us is that uh, the, there is very little difference in who is affected. Uh, in particular, 
there was a lot of talk, uh, uh, and there is still to some extent a propos vaccination, uh, on the fact that, you know, the issues of COVID uh, had already become very politicized and people were not willing to listen, either they knew or they didn't, and they, uh, the, uh, in particular, it was very, it would be very difficult to move white Republicans. But look at the knowledge increase, for example, uh, across blacks, who we don't separate by Democrat and Republican because we have all, very few black uh, Republicans. You see a decrease in 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 the knowledge gap, uh, in so it increases in knowledge for uh, black people, for uh, white Democrats, but also for white Republicans. Look at the willingness to pay for a mask. We see an increase in the willingness to pay for a mask for black people, for Democrats, and for Republicans. They start from a lower level, but their increase is actually larger than anybody else. The donation for uh, the, uh, to a black charity increase for black people, for white people, and for Republicans. So in summary, the video improved the COVID-19 knowledge, they improved behavior, um, um, self-reported uh, behavior, willingness to pay everything, and the effects were present in all groups, even Republicans, even among less educated people, both black and white. So, uh, and the racial specific framing did not matter for at least for behavior. So that now is getting super encouraging because it says basically you can go ahead with a message, uh, you know, use a diverse group of doctors, uh, everybody will be rich, the message can be simple, people will listen. So we were at this point quite ready to, to scale something up. And it turns out that uh, we got contacted by a, Facebook, a group at Facebook called Data for Good, uh, who had seen the West Bengal work, and we are interested to see whether we could work together at scale. And what we did is that they gave us uh, a credit to send ads, and we mounted a very simple ad campaign uh, in the fall of 2021. Uh, using Facebook. Facebook, of course, is a huge uh, uh, presence, uh, 230 million US accounts at the time. We were now in November 2020, so the message was quite simple. It was uh, 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 relaying the CDC message, a message encouraging people to not uh, travel for the holidays. Uh, the worry was that this was before the vaccines, that by traveling over Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, um, people would, uh, uh, um, you know, contribute to, a, to, a, to an increase in the pandemic. Many people were trying to get out uh, on Facebook to say that, and so we, we tried to say that. So we had a very uh, short message uh, delivered as sponsored content to Facebook uh, users on their, on their uh, feed. So the, the message was a 30 second message delivered by, um, you know, several doctors. So there was variation in, the, in, in who delivered the message. And it was um, uh, this Thanksgiving, the best way to show your love is to stay home, um, and stay safe, stay home. And at Christmas, we did something very similar. Uh, we, uh, the message there was that this, this holiday season to show our love, we are, uh, not, we are staying home. So in Thanksgiving, we deliver about 12, uh, oh, 30 million messages to 12 million people. At Christmas, uh, um, 80 million video posts were seen by 23 million people. The randomization was at the, was done at the county and zip code le level in the following way. Uh, there is two objectives of the design. The first one is to maximize power for a zip code level COVID data, which was available. But the mobility data was available at the county uh, level. So uh, what we did is that we, we did a two-stage experimental design. First, the counties were randomized into high versus low intensity. Second, within county, we, ra we randomly selected either 75% of the zip or 25% of the zip, 75 in the high treated, 25 in the low treated. And we, uh, we can now compare the high versus low intensity. Given the number of counties, it should be sufficient to see any significant effect on mobility. 
and then for COVID data, we can use the zip, uh, the zip level data by comparing treated and controlled zips. So we thought it was quite, uh, we were happy with that design, given what we had to achieve. So this is the, where our counties are at uh, Thanksgiving and at Christmas. This were not the same. Um, the mobility data come from uh, a pub. It was very important to us that we could use free publicly available data so we wouldn't be stuck in being unable to publish. So this is types public. You can get access to it to do whatever you want. Um, this is uh, used from uh, the ping of a cell phone user who have agreed to do that. Um, and uh, uh, Facebook aggregates it and noisify it uh, at the county level. Uh, they have a change in movement metric, which is how much are people moving, so how many dials they travel uh, in a given day. And, as, and this is all normalized with respect to the pre-COVID uh, uh, February, uh, to one month in February. And then the stay put metrics, which is the fraction of people who stay who are observing a single level uh, Bing tile. We generate the leave home variable, which is one minus stay put. Uh, note, this is only, this is considered individual who began the day in a county. So it's stacked to the place, not the person. Therefore, uh, we can look at mobility away from your home to travel for Thanksgiving, but we cannot look at the way back home. Uh, so what's relevant for us is whether people leave their home on Thanksgiving. Uh, so what do we suggest so for context? This was a bit of a peak uh, COVID time at that moment, at the time. Um, and this is what we, we find uh, in the control group. Uh, people were traveling about 10% uh, less uh, than the, than the pre-pandemic. There was an uptick in travel before, just before Thanksgiving, uh, and then much less, of course, on the Thanksgiving day. For uh, a county level regression, we simply regress on whether it's a high intensity or a low intensity with some control variable. Uh, the time period is 23 to 29th of November for Thanksgiving and 21 to 27 for Christmas. And what we find is very clear on this graph, which is uh, this is Thanksgiving, the three days before the holiday, uh, uh, travel is less. People travel fewer kilometers in treatment area compared to control areas. Um, we have a similar graph for Christmas, uh, so this is Thanksgiving. In total, they travel about one percentage point less uh, in the three days before Thanksgiving uh, than in uh, uh, in during the uh, during the holiday, and they are no, no less likely to leave their home on the day of the holiday itself. For Christmas, similarly, uh, we find uh, uh, a decline, especially. Uh, you know, the day before the 21 and the 22nd of December, aggregating again, minus three to minus one, very similar result, my, minus one percent. Um, so we found an effect of minus one percent on a basis of about uh, uh, 2.6. Uh, so this is uh, uh, actually uh, proportionally a pretty large, large effect. The case of COVID that started uh, uh, two weeks later, uh, sorry, five days later, in a, so we let five days for symptom to start, and we uh, j we take a two weeks period starting after five days and going to 19 days. Uh, there are some zero cases, so we uh, we use uh, um, hyperbolic scenes to uh, to use the to to deal with the zeros, uh, but we can use various ways, sort of uh, the same thing. Uh, for Thanksgiving, we find a decline in COVID cases of 3%, significant at the 10% level only. For Christmas, we find a decline of 4%, significant at the you know, very uh, high level of significance. And when we put them together, that's 3.5% you know, significant at the 1% at the level. So quite remarkably, uh, we find not only an effect on mobility, but also an effect on COVID, uh, which, by the way, is one of the few uh, pieces of evidence uh, that uh, a non, you know, that is based on the randomized controlled trial that a non-pharmaceutical intervention does anything on COVID. What was striking is that uh, the, the impacts were, again, uh, not 
uh, focused on democrat democratic areas. In fact, the impacts were at least as large in heavily Republican counties as they had been in Democratic counties, uh, which is true both for COVID and for, for the traveling. So, um, um, which we know by you know, the fraction of people who voted for Trump in the election. So in conclusion, uh, despite the ambient noise, uh, the fact that there is so much information, misinformation going on, both in India and the US at the time, a very light touch social media based intervention campaign still get people to change their behavior. Even on topics that appears to be ultra politicized, like travel for the holiday definitely was because we got uh, a lot of hate mail in, on our Facebook page. Uh, people seem to be affected by simple messages, regardless of race and politics and regardless of the race of the person who is speaking. So that's excellent news, not just for COVID, but I think for communication that we do not find effects that are different by political parties at the individual or geographic level. Uh, so everyone seems to be responsive to actionable information delivered by physicians. In other words, uh, um, if people uh, are, are not uh, have different level of, of, of desired behavior, it's not because they can't listen to what is being told to them, it's more likely, more likely that they are not told uh, anything helpful. So uh, this, of course, was uh, just travel before Thanksgiving. There was a lot of effort to do something similar on on vaccines. We have just we we have just com concluded quite late into the pandemic an experiment on vaccine that I don't have the result for of the similar type, but it's quite possible that the vaccine itself was so politicized that it's uh, it 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 might not work uh, as well, uh, but we will see. Uh, in general, uh, the, the lessons that is broader than just uh, than just uh, uh, COVID is that uh, they, they seem to be a role for sort of experts, you know, Abhijit Banerjee in West Bengal, but simply a doctor wearing a, a doctor outfit uh, in the Facebook experiment, speaking directly to people in simple terms and uh, explaining to them uh, what they might want to do. Uh, so I'm going to stop here to leave time for question and uh, thank you very much.